and I'd like to welcome up Elaine Chen, who is the Cummings Professor of the Practice of Entrepreneurship at Tufts University, and Director of Tufts Entrepreneurship Center and the Tufts Gordon Institute. So welcome, Elaine. Thank you, Lisa. Um, this is odd. I usually don't stand at a podium. Anyway, so I have the great pleasure of introducing the next segment, um, which is how um, at COS we make it possible and make it easy through infrastructure, specifically the open science framework. And we have um, a great panel of speakers, um, starting with Eric Olson, who is a product manager at COS, who is going to talk to us about how idealists are innovators who are the first people to adopt um, practices that drive change. Then we're going to have Professor Fiona Fiddler and um, Dr. Elliot Good from the University of Melbourne share how they actually use OSF in real life. And then um, Nikki Pfeiffer, Chief Product um, Officer at COS, will talk to us about how um, COS uses a user-centered design philosophy to make it easy so that anybody can adopt this practice. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Take us away. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, after getting a great overview of the theory of change from Lisa, Brian, and Tem, we're actually going to step back for, I'm going to ask you to step all the way back to uh, a world where the uh, barriers to, to culture change are, are formidable. That we can accept. Um, but if we haven't made any progress on, uh, on making that culture change, and there are no policies, there aren't any norms, the infrastructure isn't there yet, training hasn't been made available, there isn't a shared understanding of what to do and how to do it. If we're in that world, where do we even start uh, building toward that change? And as Elaine uh, set us up for our, our topic here, mobilization of purpose, people, resources, and energy is critical component of, of every social movement. Brian referred to the Civil Rights Act earlier. We're going to see parallels here in our journey uh, through the theory of change. And they will almost always be catalyzed by idealists. And if you want to know what the idealists look like, just look around the room here uh, at everyone that's in attendance today. And idealists are change agents. They don't accept the system as it is, as we've described earlier. Their primary motivation are the values that brought them into the field, into research. Idealists are willing to act on their values regardless of what others are doing or what is rewarded. Idealists are central to the theory of change that we've described. They are the catalysts that get it started. By being innovators, they are the first to adopt the new behaviors. Idealists demonstrate that the actions are relevant, achievable, and have intent, the intended impact. Idealists become champions of the alternative vision for research practice and initiate the formation of communities of practice in their field. Their collective actions create waves of momentum to inspire uh, others, and this sets the stage for accelerating adoption and moving into the mainstream that Wajin is going to tell us a little bit about shortly. The actions of the idealists in one field can then inspire idealists in the neighboring fields to initiate similar actions that start to parallel culture change movements in neighboring disciplines. And if idealists are inspiring idealists, uh, continues to generate across disciplinary boundaries, then the aligned waves of change can become mutually reinforcing to broaden attention on those new practices and provide a push for further adoption. Crowdsourced replication, robustness, reproducibility studies provide an example of catalyzing idealists to initiate change. The initial crowdsourced replication projects were the reproducibility project psychology, and the first mini-labs study. The purpose of these projects was to gather systematic evidence uh, about the replicability of a sample of findings. Besides the evidence that they produced about research credibility, there were a few other uh, outcomes and advantages of this work. 
These projects provided a way for the idealist to do something rather than just be frustrated by the system. These projects formed a community, those community practices that we mentioned earlier. Participating idealists learned that they were not alone in this uh, innovation. And these people aligned idealists, or these projects aligned idealists for collective action. Their influence was dramatically amplified by all working together. We have used and refined this crowdsourcing model many times over the years for an expanding range of topics, including the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology that Tim alluded to, and the SCORE program. More importantly, other innovators generalized this crowdsourcing model for research in human development, comparative behavior, neuroimaging, electronic health records research, and many others. The mini labs concept inspired many babies, many brains, many fishes, and lots of other many minis. <laughs> uh, some of those uh, noted in green, I know this is hard to see the different colors up here, um, even created institutions or tools to make this crowdsourcing work sustainable and scalable within their communities. This illustrates both the formation of innovation communities within research silos, but also the formation of transdisciplinary community of innovators. The shared methodology created a mutually reinforcing meta movement connecting and strengthening the individual reform efforts. In addition to creating reform communities, the crowdsource projects gave participating researchers experience with open scholarship practices. This was possible because the projects were co-mingled with infrastructure to implement open scholarship. RPP and many labs were the first open science framework users. The projects were gathering evidence that suggested the need for open scholarship and with OSF, providing proof of concept of life cycle open scholarship practices. Uh, we conceived and built the OSF to enable increasing rigor transparency and sharing of the entire research life cycle. As the name implies, uh, the open science framework provides scaffolding to guide research producers as they conduct their own research. Um, as well as enable research consumers to recognize the entire context of a study rather than just the small window into the work that the manuscript can offer. The structure provides specialized workflows allowing users to create and share what they need to when they need to, while also linking their materials from all phases of their research together. All that work is preserved and perpetually available for sharing and discovery. To illustrate how OSF supports uh, lifecycle open scholarship, Fiona Fiddler and Elliot Gould will present how they use OSF as part of their research process. Um, hi, I'm Fiona. Um, we're going to tell, there's two of us presenting in this section and we're going to tell you a couple of stories. Actually, I'm really sorry about this. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. So both of these stories, um, so the talk comes in two parts. Uh, the first part is a story about using OSF across disciplines. And the second part is about using OSF in one specific project, albeit a very large project. Um, and both, both of these stories have elements of using OSF across the life cycle, research life cycle. I guess that's the kind of connecting theme. So part one of our story starts in, um, it was the 22nd of May, 2014, and I was in San Francisco at the APS conference. That was the date that I made my first OSF account. Um, it was in a workshop that Brian was running called Open Science Framework Tools for Your Workflow. And um, I'd looked around OSF before, but it was that workshop that was my conversion experience. And it was very quickly followed by my first kind of big doubts about what I was doing. The, the obstacle I'd faced, the obstacle to adoption of that I had faced was an interdisciplinary one. 
Um, so despite being mostly a psychologist back in those days, I had recently started working in environmental decision centres. And when I collaborated with psychologists, um, OSF was fine. OSF was great. Um, most of my psychology, psychology collaborators were kind of advocates of reform anyway, so they were very enthusiastic and engaged with these sorts of efforts. But when I worked with ecologists and environmental scientists, things were different. Not because they weren't technically or quantitatively sophisticated, they certainly were. Um, but the problem, as I reflect on it now, was our different understandings of what the research life cycle itself was, what its practices entailed, and what it meant to be supported across that. So some interdisciplinary challenges are really fun. I really love discussions about how language and concepts change across disciplines, and I, like, I could spend a lot of time just talking about that. Um, in contrast, <laughs> uh, using different platforms and programs across disciplines is the opposite for me. It's tedious, it's frustrating. So part of my championing, championing OSF in ecology was about removing that stress in my own life, kind of minimising the number of platforms that I needed to engage with. Um, so in 2016, I somehow managed to convince Elliot uh, to help me organise an OSF workshop for this large quantitative and applied ecology group that we were both part of. It was a pretty sizeable event that we ran, a two-day event, and we had a COS delegate come and join us all the way in Melbourne, Australia, to run a hands-on workshop about uh, an introduction to OSF. And we had other presentations covering um, statistical inference, p-hacking, pre-registration, and so on. But the draw card for the ecologists and the environmental scientists was the promise of improving their data management. So one thing that I already knew before this workshop was that my ecology colleagues, um, what they did, the field work that they did was a very distant um, thing to the kind of experimental work that my psychology colleagues did. And the modelling that the ecologists did was very different from the typical hypothesis testing that um, psychologists did. But I guess what I hadn't appreciated, though, was how different our underlying models of what the research life cycle was. So unsurprisingly then, um, the emerging sticking point in our workshop was pre-registration. So, and this was around the time that the COS pre-registration challenge was kicking off too. There were detailed templates for pre-registration available during that competition. And these templates struck our group of ecologists as um, very hypothesis testing or hypoth hypothetical <laughs> deductive in nature. And they couldn't see their ecological modelling work in them. That didn't mean that they weren't concerned about the same sorts of underlying problems that we were, problems like statistical power and researcher degrees of freedom. They certainly were. Um, fortunately, Elliot's the sort of person who's intrigued by these kinds of challenges and so started a PhD project translating pre-registration templates um, to help ecological modelers manage their degrees of freedom. This wasn't simply creating a new pre-reg form, this was expanding the concept of pre-registration to fit with a different research life cycle. So us ecologists do things like generate probabilistic uh, maps of where a species is likely to be found across the landscape. Um, so that we can predict how endangered species might respond to threats like uh, bushfires or climate change and how they then might respond to different conservation interventions um, that uh, can help them um, respond to these threats. And these uh, predictions are used to help conservation managers figure out what to do with their limited uh, environmental dollars. So what we do is quite different to experimental uh, Hypoth hypothesis testing work. And so the common refrain goes, but I can't pre-register my research. I don't do hypothesis testing or, but I'm a modeler. 
So Ecologist's first objection to pre-registration uh, was around the content of pre-registration templates. They felt that um, the sorts of uh, decisions that were included in those templates um, didn't reflect the sorts of uh, decisions that they commonly faced when undertaking their uh, model development. Their second objection was around the, the process of pre-registration. Uh, Modelling is typically um, uh, non-linear, it's an iterative cycle of development, and modellers struggle to reconcile uh, this with the idea of pre-registration being a, a one-off, unalterable uh, action taken prior to uh, collecting or analysing the data. And modelers are faced with um, the genuine need to look at their data before uh, making certain types of decisions. So, for example, checking the distributional form of some variables in their models, or perhaps uh, checking for assumption violations. Um, and this breaks with pre-registration's uh, critical requirement of data-independent decision-making, meaning that models can't generate a single unalterable pre-registration of their modelling development and analysis plan. So, questionable research practices and researcher degrees of freedom are not, in the, not exclusively in the domain of hypothesis testing research. They're also a problem in model-based research. So we advocated that pre-registration can and should be undertaken in model-based research, but that it needs to reflect the norms and practices of the research context in which it is applied. So we developed a template specific to ecological modelling that captures the entire model development process uh, from construction uh, to testing and analysis of those models. And next, we've proposed a new methodology for pre-registration uh, based on a previously proposed idea of adaptive pre-registration. So we can implement this expanded view of uh, pre-registration or adaptive pre-registration uh, with our ecological modelling specific templates. Uh, using a combination of Git, uh, GitHub and the OSF. And this leverages the preprint annotation, version control, and project management features of both platforms. And there are two key features of the uh, adaptive uh, pre-registration process. Firstly, the registration of flexibility. So uh, this is where uh, the modeler can supply a decision tree uh, consisting of predefined rules about when particular modeling strategies should be implemented depending on the outcomes of previous points in the modeling process. And secondly, uh, interim pre-registrations, where the modeler uh, follows an iterative process of pre-registration, so they can proceed from ideation to pre-registration to execution of that pre-registered analysis plan and back to, back to ideation again. They create uh, interim pre-registrations at different points within the model development process, depending on observed outcomes of the pre-specified decision trees. And currently, uh, we're piloting uh, both the templates and the uh, adaptive pre registration process with a model-based uh, study in Victoria, Australia, that seeks to understand how uh, riverine vegetation responds to different environmental uh, flow regimes. And the ultimate goal of that project is to help managers decide um, how to uh, determine what optimal flows are down there. So I'll pass it back to Fiona. Okay, thanks. All right, so that's part one. Now, now we're going to tell you another story. Aren't we? Yep. So um, fast forwarding now to 2019 when our research group is about to embark on the Replicats project, where CATS stands for Collaborative Assessments for Trustworthy Science. Um, so we're back in social science territory now, and I've dragged Elliot and some other ecologists over to this project with me, and um, specifically the environmental decision modellers. 
And from 2019 to 2022, for those four years, there were about 20 of us at the University of Melbourne working on uh, across four different faculties or administrative units in the university. Um, so it was a big project, but Replicates, in fact, sat within a much bigger program, the DARPA Score program, which Tim's already introduced, that had five other teams and various sub-teams within those teams. Um, fortunately, Elliot was still sort of in the business of making impossible things happen and so set up our data management plan for that project within the OSF. So our core task on Replicats as part of the SCORE program was evaluating published research evidence. So we had, uh, we recruited thousands of participants, a community of participants to our project, and over those four years evaluated 4,000 research papers. Every paper was evaluated by five people in a little review group. And um, this included their predictions about the likely replicability or robustness of those papers. And those individual judgments of all of those reviewers needed to be aggregated somehow into a single confidence score for each paper. So all of this, um, as well as that, we also had qualitative data, so their reasoning and their justifications for those judgments. So all of this data was aggregated and synthesised into confidence scores for each of those papers that acted as an indicator of how credible the evidence was. And now Elliot will, in the next three minutes, explain how OSF helped us with that. <laughs> So pulling the, the data flows and systems together into a single coherent data pipeline uh, that generated our internal data product metrics and analyses, as well as uh, calculating and delivering our confidence scores was a fairly daunting undertaking. We integrated multiple different platforms, systems and programming languages into a single uh, tool change and continuously operating pipeline at which the OpenSign framework science framework was at the heart. The most important uh, component of our data ecosystem was the elicitation platform. And on this platform, uh, we repackaged the research claims, metadata and papers uh, on the OSF provided to us from our friends at COS. And we presented them to our participants to use in their assessments. And within the uh, remit of uh, the Replicats project, we need to figure out, well, how do we aggregate uh, all of these estimates from our uh, participants? And so we pre-registered 28 different aggregation methods uh, on the OSF, and then we packaged them uh, into a um, series of R functions on GitHub. And this is currently a published open source package that anyone is uh, free to use. And uh, we built another R package uh, called Copycat, so we didn't have to uh, copy and paste all of the R scripts that tied everything together from downloading COS's claims metadata to importing it into our platform, uh, from downloading our data and then taking it to aggregate and then deliver our confidence scores back to the OSF. And tying all of this together was yet another cat-themed uh, repository, and this was CatNap. And so one of the, the key difficulties in managing this whole data pipeline was the continuously uh, evolving and uh, dynamic nature of the data. So we were receiving regular batches of claims data with which we had to upload and give to our participants. And of course, uh, we had ongoing workshops and online assessments. So we were continuously receiving new data. Um, so uh, we integrated uh, some uh, continuous analysis uh, that automated this entire pipeline. And of course, uh, sent all of our results back to the OSF. So um, there are two stories um, illustrating us how OSF has helped us across um, the research life cycle. And now I'm handing over to, to Joanna. Mm -hmm. 
also in my haste to get to OSF, I uh, didn't introduce um, Johanna properly. Johanna Cohoon was with OSF and COS since the very, very beginning. Um, so she's seen 10 years of growth, and she's an expert in how OSF can be a persuasive technology. And Johanna. Uh, so I'm Johanna Cohoon, and thank you for having me be here. I have been in the open science community since 2013. I was a project coordinator for the reproducibility project psychology. And uh, this does not, there we go. Okay, so that work got me interested in how science practice changes over time and how technology can play a pivotal role in that change. And inspired by this question and my experience at COS, I went to UT Austin to get my PhD. And there, I conducted a qualitative study of open science and OSF, its development and its use and its non-use also. And in a nutshell, what I saw was a strategic effort at persuasion and consensus building. So this was what I'll talk about for the next few minutes. While at COS, I'd seen firsthand that open science is not universally popular. You can look on Twitter, too. Um, and HCI research emphasizes that when users and designers have different values, there are likely to be difficulties in gaining technological adoption. We know many researchers want to keep their work private to reap rewards that they might have in the future, and conflicts could also arise because they value things like their time over the possible benefits of open science. So how can a system like OSF not just avoid value conflicts, but also bring about actual change in researchers' behavior? So to answer this question, I observed OSF developers interviewed them over Zoom, interviewed users and non-users, and gathered documents and artifacts like GitHub issues for analysis. And what I saw is that OSF uses persuasion strategies to align user behavior with open science best practices, but simultaneously OSF also aligns itself to its users' conceptions of how open science should get done. So first we'll talk about some ways OSF persuades. A persuasive technology reinforces, changes, or shapes attitudes or behaviors without coercion or deception. And persuasive technologies can work by making the desired behavior easier to accomplish, by providing an informative experience, and by providing social cues. And on OSF, we see these strategies being implemented by design. So one basic social cue we're all familiar with is peer pressure, or put more formally, it's normative influence. We see our peers and our colleagues' behavior, and we align our own to match theirs. And the nature of open science being public means that this persuasion tactic is built into open science systems. And this normative influence is how people like U12, or user 12 in my study, learn to pre-register their research. I talked with U12 about their experience on OSF, and they told me, on OSF, there's a bunch of pre-reg templates to download, and they kind of guide you with what content you should put in there. I think they're just hosted on someone's own OSF page. And then I just download a Word document, and I type into them. And so U12 was influenced by this public example of open science and aligned themselves to it, believing this to be normative behavior. And this kind of normative influence is especially powerful because while it might be initiated through a technology, it can propagate to tertiary researchers who don't use that technology yet and bring them on board. So U12, for example, had a student that they mentored, and they learned to pre-register in that same way with the Word document. <laughs> and you might be more familiar with registering research on OSF through the built-in feature that we've already talked about. And that actually provides another really good example of persuasive technology, tunneling. Tunneling leads users through a predetermined sequence of actions or events that they might not have engaged in otherwise. So by constraining navigation and creating a captive audience, Tunneling prompts users to enact certain behaviors and then also creates expectation for how you would do that behavior in future. 
The registration feature on OSF guides users through this step-by-step -step form, asks them to disclose facts about their research study. You should share your recruitment strategy, analysis plan, etc. And this tunneling makes registration easier for users because this process is clearly defined and facilitated. And it's also worth noting that this is not the only way OSF could try and persuade users. Uh, there could be a page of text telling us about registrations. There could be a video. There could be incentives. And all of these things have been done. Uh, but there's also this design choice, a strategic one to use tunneling to align users' behavior with open science goals. Tunneling allows OSF to establish expectations for what this particular open science practice should look like. And this creates what comes to be understood as the right way to do open science, at least on this platform. And you might be thinking that if tunneling through this form is the right way to do open science, then ostensibly U12 did it wrong with the Word document. And U12 actually worried that. Rather than use the registration feature and follow the tunnel that OSF developers built, U12 filled out that Word document by, that they'd found on searching OSF. They uploaded 12 pages worth of information. This was essentially a draft of their final paper, and they uploaded that as a PDF. Because U12 had already learned to pre-register based on this public example, and so they didn't realize that there was another way to register without using the PDF. And I showed them the button to click to use OSF's native registration feature. And they said, oh god, <laughs> is this like to formally freeze it? I would hope that my pre-registration still counts, because I guess it's time stamped. So through the study of OSF's use and development, it's become especially clear that there isn't yet a firm routine for what open science practices like registration should look like. And infrastructure developers and researchers alike have interests that they want to protect. U12 wanted to fit in with their peers. And OSF developers want users to follow a tunnel that captures their research plans in this auditable database. But negotiating these interests is far from over. The way that open science gets done is still changing. And this also isn't just because of what COS employees think. Something really interesting is how these persuasion efforts dovetail with the ongoing negotiation. So rather than act as a steamroller that flattens the dimensionality of science according to the operator's protocol, OSF uses persuasion to align its users while also conforming itself to meet users' expectations. So time and again, I saw OSF developers turn to their users while making decisions about the platform. They conducted user research. They collected user logs. They referenced issues logged in the code repository. And we can see this negotiation in the registration feature. For years, the way that OSF implemented registrations required that users have an OSF project first. And D2, OSF Developer 2, told me it's always been a sore point with users that they have to go and create a project first in order to create a registration. Because that's a very us way of thinking about things. <laughs> but rather than double down on their way of thinking, D2 and COS acknowledge that there are alternatives. D2 went on, for users, a registration is not a time-frozen view of a project. It's something that goes into a registry and is its own object. In early 2021, things changed, and a way was introduced to register research without having to start with an OSF project. And this better fit with users' mental models. And OSF developers knew that and pursued the change because they'd done user research and repeatedly leveraged user data to drive decision making. And they continued to use this data as they evaluated the change, too. So during a meeting that I observed in July 2021, D7 told the project team that these new no-project registrations were a success. They were about twice as popular as the original registrations. So even though that the registration feature was designed to persuade users, users have, in a way, persuaded developers to align the platform with users' concept for how open science should get done. 
And this kind of mutual consensus building or ongoing negotiation shows us that how open science gets done is still changing. And the processes like user research and database decision making that COS engages in, these processes actually ensure the negotiation happens. And again, this isn't the only way things could get done. COS could develop a plan and implement it top down with no opportunity for feedback. But instead, OSF attempts to persuade users while also evolving to better align with users' natural behavior. So this technological consensus building helps OSF reduce the likelihood of value tensions, creating a better and a more persuasive product. And because this negotiation is ongoing, it means that U12 wasn't wrong. U12 is showing us that open science practice is more flexible than we might have realized. And incorporating feedback loops like COS does helps embrace these different perspectives to build technology that's more persuasive and more assistive. Thank you. Uh, thanks to my participants. And there's some of this interview data online. <laughs> What I wanted to come back to was what Eric started with, um, which is really to talk about those idealists again and how idealists are the catalysts for adoption of new technology and behavior. But technology designed for these idealists will fail. Idealists are tolerant of friction because they are motivated by the behavior. Um, but for most people, there are these competing motivations and concerns that create barriers, just like Hannah was talking about. Researchers are busy. They have existing workflows and tools that they use. And to reach early adopters, you have to lower these barriers uh, to entry and make it possible to integrate new tools into their existing workflows. So let's talk about those barriers to entry and how do we better understand them. Perfect example that Hannah was talking about, where we use user research to focus our design to, towards users called user-centered design. And we really want to understand who we're talking about, who are these users, and it's not the idealists in this case. We really are focused on the mainstream. And we want to understand what technologies they use. What are their current workflows? Um, and that's how we better understand those barriers and build solutions with integration and interoperability. And then we watch how they use it. We want to understand what's working, what's not. We want to test and iterate and continue to repeat that cycle. And ultimately, the goal is to re meet researchers where they are and take an incremental approach. Ultimately, the optimization to enable adoption of open science uh, is the path. So there are some risks to taking this approach uh, that can prevent the scaling of this uh, adoption model. And the first is generalization. So when we think about the disciplinary silos, and the opportunity for overgeneralization is present, where the solution isn't fit for purpose um, and it won't scale. The other option is to undergeneralize, where we create these unnecessary silos and have redundancy, which limits standard setting and mutually reinforcing waves. So the solution is to standardize when possible um, and customize when necessary. So here's a, an illustrative example, which has been a theme through the other talks with Fiona and Elliot and Hannah, that really focuses in on pre-registration. And we'll start, start talking about the templates available on OSF. First, we started with very unstructured formats where we didn't talk about what to register or how to register. And over time, we developed those pre-registration standards uh, for our own large-scale collaborative research, as Tim mentioned, many labs. This evolved to a standard that was used for the pre-reg challenge, which was aimed at incentivizing researchers trying out pre-registration. Eventually, this evolved into a general standard on OSF. That's a template that uh, many have used um, and found ways to innovate on top of, which has brought the domain experts to develop new formats on OSF and other registries. Again, perfect example that Elliot gave. So, uh, the hope is in the future, um, we'll continue to see experts come create new uh, formats. Hopefully a model-based format will be coming soon and others from other communities to make it possible and easy for communities to try pre-registration. 
So another risk to this approach is overconfidence. We need evidence to confirm that our solutions are working. We need evaluation, it's key. We need to innovate, test, iterate, and evaluate again. And we wanna make sure that we uh, commit to the mission and not solutions or our own solution. So one example of this um, is Quick Files. This is a feature that we released back in 2018. Very excited, we had created a, 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 a workflow for sharing files could be data, could be protocols, could be preprints, whatever it was, quickly and easily without the creation of a project. But what we learned over time and looking at the usage metrics was actually that this wasn't meeting open uh, life cycle open science in the way that we had envisioned. It wasn't enabling those standards for metadata and the linkages between different uh, artifacts of research back to the rest. It was just single file sharing. So ultimately, we decided the right decision here was to sunset this feature, and we did that in 2022. Another risk is bureaucratic burden. So we know researchers are busy. We actually really want to empathize with that and understand what it is they're doing and how they're doing it. And we want to make sure that adding new practices isn't the solution because practices that just get added on to what they already do are not likely to be adopted. So we need to come up with better solutions that add value, that help them, that integrate into what they're already doing so that we can lead to the adoption. We wanna make open science not burdensome, but just part of everyday research and how it gets done. So again, making adoption possible and easy is the foundation for the successful reform movement. 